most of you are probably aware that it's a rare privilege to be able to uh, roast slash introduce a postdoc, um, but I'm going to be brief despite that opportunity. Um, it's really my privilege to introduce Kristen. Uh, Kristen came to uh, UCSF from her MD-PhD at uh, UCSD in Berkeley, uh, where in the lab of Andy Dillon, she did really amazing work looking at the interactions of the nervous system with peripheral tissue in the context of neurodegeneration. And um, Kristen evolved her interests as well as her organism when she came to my lab to really look at the um, neural substrates of social attachment. And um, to use the cliche to say that she built the foundation of transcriptomics is really an understatement. She, we're talking about building from like the mantle to the top of the Burj Khalifa in terms of the amount of work that she did in putting together our platform for um, really understanding the molecular substrates um, in terms of social attachment. And um, Kristen's going to talk about her work understanding how environmental as well as genetic influences really contribute to um, disorders of social attachment or disruptions of social attachment in particular in her interests uh, late in life. So, thank you. So, that was quite an introduction. <laughs> Thanks, Deb. Um, so as Deb mentioned, and thank you all for being here, as Deb mentioned, in the lab we're generally interested in understanding the neural basis of social attachment behavior. And what I'm particularly interested in is how these behaviors extend across the lifespan and how diseases of aging actually impact on these. And I think everyone here being in mental health and being humans can understand why social attachments are so important to human health and how they become so dramatically disrupted in our patients with mental illness. So humans are pretty unique in the fact that they form these long-term selective affiliations in what we're calling attachments. So mates form pair bonds we seek proximity to our partners, we form a preference for particular partners, and we have a grief response with loss of our partner. We also form family units in which we demonstrate biparental care of offspring. We provide nutrition and protection and social interactions for our young. And as I said, social attachments become extremely disrupted in the context of mental illness. So I think, think some of the diseases that commonly come to mind when we think of social behavior is autism spectrum disorder, or schizophrenia in adolescence. And these are disorders where there are profound deficits in social behavior. And these are also very heritable diseases and diseases where we know um, that there are risk genes associated with them. But we also know of environmental conditions that can very much affect attachment behaviors. And the diseases that kind of come to mind when we think of this, or the disorders, are personality disorders. And so these very much demonstrate where we can see social, social behavior deficits. And these very much demonstrate that there's this complex interplay between genes and environment that needs to be there for social attachment behavior to develop appropriately. I keep saying the word development. So these are um, things that we think of as being um, disorders of early life that extend then throughout the lifespan. And as I mentioned, what I'm interested in is this period of late life. We know significantly less about what happens um, late in age for people. And yet we know that neurodegenerative disorders are often characterized by social deficits. And FTD in particular, so this is frontotemporal lobe dementia, is a disorder where the hallmark uh, deficit for them is social behavior deficits that occur as some of the earliest symptoms that we see. And these are highly heritable diseases where there have been risk genes that have been associated with it. But there are also environmental factors that can play a huge role in our geriatric populations. So social isolation, we know, is a has a profound impact for our geriatric patients. And so, and we also know that social isolation is not only a consequence of many of our mental illnesses, but can become, is increasingly thought of as a significant risk factor, actually, for diseases of aging and particularly neurodegenerative disorders. So I'm going to take a look at, the, at either an environmental impact or a disease impact that has an effect on social attachment behavior and how it allows us to probe this at a neurological level, um, especially in aging. So what is our understanding of what happens in the brain when attachments are disrupted? Looking at human imaging studies in patients who have um, these very significant attachment disorders. So this is from a review that was looking at patients with neurodevelopmental disorders, like autism. And looking at human imaging data, so we have this sort of global view of the brain. These are large areas of the brain, places in cortex and the amygdala that seem to mediate a large number of different aspects of social behavior. This gives us a, a pretty general view, 
but we lack a detailed map of the circuits that underlie um, a lot of aspects of social behavior. So where are the specific neuronal populations within these areas of cortex? Where do they project to in the brain? And what specific aspects of behavior are they mediating? And particularly, which parts are mediating attachment behavior? And part of the reason that we don't really understand this that well is that none of the commonly used genetic animal models display adult social attachments. So for this reason, in the lab we use the prairie vole. So this is a monogamous species. That, and by that mean we, we mean that they form long-term pair bonds. They also display these higher order affiliative um, interactions, so bonds between um, same sex and co-housed animals. They show biparental care of offspring, and they also show a very significant stress phenotype with loss of a mate or with isolation. And a lot of what we know about the behavior in these animals actually comes from comparing to very closely related rodent species that are promiscuous. So the metavole shown here doesn't have any of these behaviors, and they spend most of their time in isolation. And very early work done by Tom Insel and Sue Carter and other groups started to allow us to know what was happening in the brain that really mediated this pair bond formation in the prairie voles versus the meadow voles. And they identified two neuropeptides, oxytocin and vasopressin, that are very important for allowing the monogamous species to pair bond. So this is sort of the, where we are in terms of understanding attachment behavior. Um, and so what I'm going to go through in my talk is to actually show how we start with behavior and then we can map what's happening in the brain down to the molecular level. And I want to show initially a kind of background demonstration of just how robust these attachment behaviors are and why the prairie vole makes an ideal system for studying this. So here we've taken a male and it's been bonded to a female for, and they've been co-housed for about a week. And then we remove the female, leave the male in its, its home cage. And then when we reintroduce its bonded mate, we see a pretty characteristic response. So it's very adorable and they spend most of their time huddling like this in their cages. And so if we take that same male and we take out its female that it's been bonded to and we, and we introduce a novel female that it doesn't know, we see something quite different. He's not sure. And so these two do not go on to huddle in their cage. And this is actually something exceptionally rare. Males of most species do not aggressively reject a novel potential mate that's been put in front, of, in front of them. So what this shows us is that prairie voles are actually forming a selective attachment. And that something's happening in their brains to then mediate a differential um, response in their behavior. And this is important because what I've told you is that what I want to study is social isolation. But for us, social isolation only becomes meaningful in the context of an attachment, of this type of attachment behavior. If we care about who we've partnered with or who we're, we've grown up with, what we care about when we lose them is because we've lost this attachment. And so prairie voles make this ideal model for us to then study how we actually, how that loss is meaningful for social isolation. So I'm going to talk a little bit about how we then look in the brain of these animals to understand that. So again, we go back to this comparative approach where we have prairie voles and meadow voles, so a promiscuous species and a monogamous species. And here what I'll be showing is data from animals that have been co-housed, but then we remove one um, from this group that it's been living with its whole life. But we've also done this with pair-bonded animals as well, or with animals that have been mated. And we acutely isolate them, and then we can use um, an antibody stain. So thanks to Chris for introducing kind of how this works. But we use an antibody to a specific marker for neuronal, neuronal activity. So everywhere in the brain that we see red in this case, it's, it's marking an active neuron. And so if we look in the control condition, and an important aspect is that we want to look in an unbiased way across the brain. So previously a lot of studies have looked at specific regions of interest or identified areas of cortex that, that people have um, known are important for social interactions. But we want to just take an unbiased view through the whole brain which regions are active. And if we look at the control condition of non-isolated prairies that have been group housed, we see in a particular region, the, the amygdala, we see a pretty 
low level of baseline activity. If we then isolate the prairie voles, we can see that there are active neurons in this region. But what actually get this is kind of a, it may be just a generalized response to a change to the environment, um, the social interaction condition. And if so, we should expect to see this in the meadow voles as well. But if this is also marking something about the attachment that's been lost, then we'll see it only specifically in the prairie voles. So we've done this with our animals, the prairie voles and the meadow voles, and isolated them. And when we look in this particular region of the amygdala, we see again this neural activity in the prairie voles, but then we also see this in the meadow voles. So it's marking something about a change to the environment and to the isolation. But we're also able to identify regions throughout the brain that are specific to the prairie voles and specifically active under this isolation context. So regions in the prelimbic cortex and the lateral septum are active only in the prairie voles. So what this tells us is these brain regions are not only registering the isolation, but what the meaning of that is, the loss of the attachment. So our next question is what might be mediating this differential response? And we have a clue from those earlier comparative studies where they identified that oxytocin and signaling through the receptor is important for pair bonding and attachment behavior. But we haven't had any tools to actually genetically manipulate these species before. So our lab, and Dave has done a lot of work, to actually adapt CRISPR-based tools to the prairie bull system. So we have generated some of the first animals that actually carry a knockout for the oxytocin receptor. So you can see here in the peptide sequence that there's a premature stop codon that results in a truncated protein that's not functional. And then you can see that represented in the imaging below where there's a ligand, <coughs> a ligand binding assay that um, you can see in the wild type animals, there's robust ligand binding throughout the brains to the oxytocin receptor indicating it's, it's expressed and it's there. Whereas we look in the oxytocin receptor knockouts and it's completely gone. So we've got a complete null for this receptor. And so then when we go back to our isolation condition, how does the loss of this receptor um, alter that activity that we saw before in these particular regions that are um, registering isolation um, and, lone, and kind of this loss of attachment. So if we look in the lateral septum and in the prelimbic cortex again, we see in the wild type condition that there is this, this activity that we'd seen before, but then we also see this dramatic increase in activity in the oxytocin receptor mutants. And so we're looking at kind of more conditions of what this might mediate, but what it may indicate is that the oxytocin receptor is normally acting in the wild types to modulate which neurons and how active they are in this isolation context. But these have, this has been kind of an unbiased approach to looking at which regions might be active and, and how we start to think about um, the circuits of isolation. But we also knew that, and these are all areas that where the receptor is expressed, but we know that the paraventricular nucleus in the hypothalamus is a very important region for social behavior. And because this is where the signal for the receptor is produced. This is where oxytocin is produced for most of the brain. So we wanted to look here at when you have a loss to the receptor, what's actually happening in the cells that are producing oxytocin. And so if you look and compare it between the wild type and the mutants, we actually see a sex-specific difference in the numbers of cells that are producing oxytocin. So that's what's stained in red here. It's no longer activity, but the numbers of cells producing oxytocin. And this is specifically in the females that we see a significant difference. And so not only is the loss of oxytocin receptor affecting levels of activity in specific behavioral contexts, but it also has this anatomic and architectural difference that's happening throughout development um, in the cells that are producing the signal for the receptor. So we have all these brain regions. We have some regions of cortex, the lateral septum, and now we have paraventricular, the PBN and the hypothalamus. But are these regions actually connecting to each other? Are they signaling to each other directly? And so in order to look at that, we can actually inject a tracer. And this is a retrograde tracer, so it spreads backwards throughout the brain and labels different regions that are then projecting to our area of interest where we've injected it. And so if we do that and we inject into the lateral septum, because this was a region that we saw come up in a lot of our, our assays as robustly differentially activated, we find several regions throughout the brain that are um, where neurons are projecting and connecting directly to the lateral septum. 
So one of these regions, very nicely, is the prelimbic cortex. So this was one of our areas that we had identified previously as being differentially activated. But we also see regions of the brain that are involved in sensory, processing sensory information, and also processing and integrating information about social stimuli, areas like insular cortex and medial amygdala. So these are all regions that are starting to give us an idea of what might be a map for the brain regions that are processing social attachments. So we start to have this, this preliminary map. Neurons in lateral septum and other brain regions are responsive to social isolation and the receptor for oxytocin modulates this activity potentially. But what we don't have at this point is an idea of the principal players, the molecular players that are acting in those brain regions to set up this differential response. We have a few kind of ideas about oxytocin and vasopressin, but we've been limited from there. And so one way to actually look at what are the other molecular players that set up this difference is to do a profiling of the transcriptional response under different attachment conditions. And so the way we do that is to, again, go back to our comparative approach where we take the prairie voles that are monogamous and we compare it to a promiscuous species. And here we're going to look at pair bonding because this is a, a place where we know that this behavior has dramatic changes for these species between the two. And we can um, pair bond these animals, and then we can take tissue from two regions of interest to start. So this is our preliminary pilot data with our transcriptional profiling. We've taken the PVN because this is where we know the signal starts, and then we can take tissue from the lateral septum where we found this really robust differential response where the receptors are uh, normally expressed. And then we take the tissue, we send the RNA, and we, we get an idea of the transcriptional profile there. So here we can just start to get a sense of the gene expression signature if we look between meadow voles and prairie voles in the lateral septum. So this is hundreds and maybe thousand genes that are differentially expressed. Up is um, upregulated is um, indicated in red and down in blue. And so this is a huge list, but it starts to give us an idea of what this um, what this difference might be. Well, we expect a, a kind of long list because we're looking between two entirely different species. So if we want to kind of narrow this down, and what are specific sets of genes that may be differentially regulated in a specific condition? So if we look in the prairie voles, both pre-pairing and then post-bonding, we can start to really narrow down um, what are the genes that are important. This um, is indicating in lateral septum. And then we can take those genes and actually look, are they functionally related to each other? Do we know from other studies and from annotations of the um, transcriptional profile which genes actually act in the same functional processes in the cell? And this may start to give us an idea of which, which parts of the cell and how the cell works to actually create the attachment condition. So I've shown you kind of how we go from a gene signature down to a specific um, set of genes. But how is this relevant to human disease? Does our, anything about our gene attachment profile overlap with genes that we know are implicated in disorders of social attachment? I mentioned previously that a lot of these diseases, like autism and, and FTD, are very heritable and have um, risk genes that are associated. So if we start with our profile, we were kind of talking about how do we know the functions um, that we're identifying in our, our different assays are actually relevant um, in disease. And so we can take these profiles that we know are important in attachment and see if these are also affected in disorders of attachment. But then what we can do is then go back to um, take our patients and those patients that have specific genes that have been very highly linked to disease and say, what, do we, what happens in our vol system if we perturb those genes? How does that affect the network that we're starting to generate here? Um, so it gives us this really powerful way to move back and forth between disease and our vol system. So in conclusion, I've told you that the oxytocin receptor really modulates potentially neuronal activity in the lateral septum and connect other connected brain regions in response to social isolation. And we're currently working in the lab to actually further characterize the molecular, developmental, behavioral phenotypes that we see as a consequence of the loss of this receptor. And that's really been interesting to see what we, um, what we find. And then I've also created a pipeline using these unbiased molecular approaches to start to build, kind of from the ground up, a circuit and a transcriptional map for understanding attachment behaviors. I'm also really interested in um, looking again at this meadow and prairie comparison, but looking at the genome level, at how these circuits are actually hardwired into the brain to drive attachments in the prairie bowl specifically.
But ultimately, as I said, we want to identify conserved attachment mechanisms that are relevant to neuropsychiatric disease. And my interest, kind of from starting residency, has always been in the geriatric population and in diseases of aging. And so I mentioned that FTD in particular, the hallmark of this disease is disrupted attachments. So what I have um, kind of been proposing and what I'll be actually continuing to work on in a fellowship through our department is to look at FTD. And as I mentioned, there are risk genes that have been very highly linked to this. And so one of these is progranulin. And progranulin um, acts in a way that we, we don't quite understand, but it accounts for as much as 10% of patients with both sporadic and familial forms of frontotemporal lobe dementia. And we know that patients who are hemizygous or only carry one functional copy for progranulin 100% of the time develop FTD. So what I can do is, as I showed you, I can take this risk gene and that we've identified in humans and go back to the whole system. And so we can generate bulls that are lacking progranulin, progranulin using these really powerful molecular genetic tools um, that we've developed in the lab. We can see how their, beha their attachment behaviors become disrupted and then identify changes to this circuit, to this map that we're starting to develop, and then to the gene networks that we're also um, identifying. But ultimately, again, I want to be able to move easily back between um, the lab and the patients. And so I've been really lucky to, um, our lab is on the fourth floor, and the Memory and Aging Center is down on the first floor in Sandler. And so Bruce Miller, Dr. Bruce Miller and Howie Rosen are working at the Memory and Aging Center, and they have a program project grant that specifically um, uh, recruiting patients with FTD and getting a really enhanced kind of view of their genetics and di different diagnostic markers. And then I'll be working with Dr. Crystal from our department to really characterize more comprehensively the psychiatric and social symptoms that are um, really plaguing these patients with FTD and some of the earliest symptoms that they have. And so then that helps me to also have access to these genetic and diagnostic markers that we can translate back and forth between the whole system to ultimately really allow us to understand at a more fundamental level how we understand attachment behaviors and how this has relevance to our patients. So that, thank you. And I want to thank everybody in my lab who's been so helpful and I forgot to mention with the sequencing work that Amanda Everett from the Wilsey lab has been really helpful in the analysis for that. And Dr. Bruce Miller and Howie Rosen from Memory Aging and of course the RITP. Thank you. We do know in the mouse models that have been made for progranulin, you just, I think most people have been looking for this dramatic loss that sort of recapitulates what's seen in the patients or where we've been looking at in the patients. And actually with progranulin, I don't think that people have been specifically looking for this synaptic or earlier markers of dysfunction in, in the cells that might sort of be a signal to what's, what's to come. And we could definitely look at that in the polls to get a sense of what are these earlier markers before you just see this dramatic loss of volume. So in the um, the first slide that came after the oxytocin, the, that was activity again. So it was increased activity. Just generally increased activity. Yeah. So I guess the question I have is that, that you have some uh, you have an interpretation that linked that to social functioning. Then I was wondering that that I mean, you know you have the auto regulation, mm -hmm. you have the increase in receptor, you have the increase in yeah. oxytocin, maybe just generally increasing activity across all brain regions where oxytocin is expressed. Yeah. 
was there some additional piece of data that led you to come to a conclusion that that was that somehow oxytocin was being selectively modulated in that region mm -hmm. for immediate social mm -hmm. bonding? So, a little bit from more uh, previous work that's shown us that there are, that this is a region that's just rich with oxytocin receptor, and we know that it modulates social behavior in the lateral septum, specifically and in prelimbic cortex, and in just in general the control kind of for that in the oxytocin receptor nulls, we don't see this just rampant activation of activity across the brain. It's in specific regions, and in these regions that we've been identifying are already differentially regulated in our social attachment conditions.